So let us get started with a question. What do you think requires more intelligence? Playing the game of chess or opening a door? Right? I mean, many times we think that chess is a matter of genius. So if chess was actually hard to do, then building machines which can play chess should also be way harder than building machines which can open doors. But let's see what we have managed to do in artificial intelligence. You know, we probably heard about AI systems surpassing humans at the game of chess. This is not today, but 20 years ago. Right, since then, we have had AI systems which can play complex multiplayer games and surpass humans even at this complex game of Go. But now, let's you know, take a look at opening doors. <laughs> now you might think I'm showing you bad videos, but let me assure you, these are the best teams competing in the DARPA Grand Finals just seven years ago. You know, doing simple things like opening doors, climbing stairs, is actually very hard. Right? <laughs> okay, so, you know, let's try to understand why is this the case? So there seems to be this dichotomy between what we think is hard and what our robots find to be hard. And in this talk, you know, what I'm going to communicate to you is that human intuition of what we think is hard really gets in our way and you know, kind of stops us from really building intelligent systems. Now, many scientists have pondered about this. You know, I'll start with a quote from Hans Morawick, you know, one of the people who thought about AI quite a lot. And here is what he has to say. You know, reasoning requires very little computation. You know, reasoning like the kind of reasoning you have in chess. Right? But sensory motor skill requires enormous compute. I took out another scientist, you know, Steven Pinker from Harvard. The main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that hard problems like chess are actually easy. And easy problems like walking and opening a door are actually hard. These observations came to be known as the Morawick's paradox. You know, some people have gone ahead to speculate, right, that machines or AI systems are going to do jobs which we think are cognitively challenging quite soon. For example, being a board member, being a data analyst, or being creative and making paintings. But jobs which require physical intelligence are going to be not being able to done by machines for a long time to come. Now, why is this? And the reason is that we are least aware of things that we do very well. For example, our heart is beating. We are breathing. But are we aware of it? When you walk, are you aware of it? You know, these systems are working all the time. They are flawless. You don't even think about them. This is what was quoted by Marvin Minsky, you know, one of the co-founders of the MIT's AI lab and a Turing Award winner. Right? And then he goes on to say that we are more aware of simple processes that do not work well. And when he says simple, again, think of chess. And this is not an abstract concept. I think all of us have experienced this model X paradox in our lives. You know, imagining riding a bicycle. You know, when you learned how to ride a bicycle, very early on, you probably paid attention to every, you know, every movement of your foot. Where is the handle going? But after some time, it becomes natural. It becomes intuitive. You don't even think about it. Right? So let's take this idea 
and you know, apply it to and use it to understand the evolution of intelligence. So life started you know, some 3.7 billion years ago with single cell organisms. It, then it took around you know, 3.7 billion years to come to apes. Now what can apes do? Simple sensory motor stuff, you know, like uh, hanging from branches, you know, picking up a fruit, throwing it, so on and so forth. Then it took you know, a few million years or 20 million years for humans to evolve. Then a few million years for language to come in. And then you know, we are just 50,000 to 150,000 years from when language started. So maybe there's a lesson over here also, that evolution spent a lot of time evolving sensory motor skills and relatively very, very little time developing language or reasoning that we think is complex today. You know, just to give a sense of these numbers, you know, imagine that the origin of Earth, we are describing it in one day. Right? So we have start of the, you know, Earth is born at midnight, and they're going to look at you know, a 24 hours period. So language is just 10 seconds old. Right? Humans are just one minute 26 or one minute 20 seconds old. Apes are maybe six minutes old. But life started 20 hours ago. So that gives you the sense of how much time it took to get to these simple skills. Now, what is this implication for building a robot? Right? So I, for one, you know, want to have a robot which can do the mundane things that I do at my house today. Right? Now, if I say to the robot, you know, make me dinner, the first thing the robot needs to understand is, you know, what is dinner, what do I eat, what are the recipes, and how to make it, right? Now, this is what language might give us, right? Now, there's another part, which is physical intelligence, which is how do I actually make dinner, which I have to chop vegetables, so on and so forth. So now, let's look back at our timeline. So how much time it took for language understanding? 10 seconds. How much time for physical intelligence? Maybe 20 hours. Right. So what, what have we done in AI today is you know, we have taken large amounts of data from the internet and developed very capable systems which can understand language. You know, just to give you a very quick summary of how they work, you know, so these systems are called as language models. They consume a lot of data. And then, given a few words, they try to predict what words are going to come next. Right? For example, you know, the question is, Coke is in. And then the AI system can you know, make a prediction of what the next words are going to be. Right? Here is you know, one prediction made by the system. Let us ask it a different question and see what the prediction is. You know, sounds very reasonable, right? Maybe let's ask another question. And let's see what the answer is. You know, maybe, maybe a bit nonsensical. But, but the point is, you know, yes, you know, there are a few aberrations. But these systems are becoming really, really good. Right? And we can also hook up images with these systems. It's just not about language. Right? For example, you know, we can ask an AI system to generate an image of a tutu on a stroll with a dog. Right? Something which probably is, you know, we never imagined. Right? or something like draw images of an avocado chair. Right? And these systems can do it. Right? So what does this mean, that we have such good language understanding in context of building robots that could you know, be in my house? Right? So the Morawieck's paradox was made in you know, 1988 after observing 35 years of AI research. Now we are almost in 2023 which means it is almost 35 years since then. Right? And let's look at an attempt you know, to build a robotic system to replicate some household things. So this is a very impressive system you know, put out by Google you know, some time back. And the question is, you know, someone spilled the Coke, and they want the robot to clean the mess. So let's look at you know, what the robot ends up doing. Right? It realizes it needs to find a Coke. It goes, it grasps this Coke can, and then it tries to throw it in the trash can. (laughs) 
but it cannot throw it, right? Then it moves ahead and says, hey, you know, I need something to wipe off the table, so I'm going to pick up this pad and take it to go wipe the table. But it cannot wipe the table. <laughs> OK, so what is the lesson? The Morovex paradox still triumphs. Like 35 years have passed, you know, and still the same problem exists. Right? Now, I don't want to be here 35 years from now and tell you the same thing. Right? So we, we need to fix this. So now, what, what actually is the problem? Right? The problem is, you know, to get to language understanding, which is equivalent of 10 seconds of evolution, we have pretty much consumed all of the internet. Right? Now, how are we going to go to sensory motor skills? Right? So, you know, some people think that, hey, you know, maybe we can get to artificial intelligence without doing physical intelligence. Now, I can talk a lot about this, right? But in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you my bet. My bet is no. And these paradoxes that we have you know, seen so far also happen in physical intelligence. And this is what it, you know, makes physical intelligence challenging. I'd like to give you an example. You know, consider a robot doing a backflip. Impressive, right? But you know, what about the behavior of walking? Seems very simple. Right? But when you do a backflip, you know, maybe what you're doing is a specialized motion that you only have to reason about your own motor system. But when I'm walking, then I have to walk on many different terrains, so I need to reason about the environment. So these systems have to generalize through a large variety of terrains. And this is what makes them challenging. Right? So, you know, so the question which me and my lab are trying to look at is, you know, how do we get to physical intelligence? And I'm going to briefly now tell you, you know, some of the ideas and techniques that we have been using. Right? For the one thing we heavily make use of is simulation. You know, because in simulation, we can generate lots of data. Right? In three hours, we can generate you know, 100 days worth of data. Right? So this is you know, an example where we can simulate many, many robots in parallel. Then in simulation, you know, they can learn how to walk. Right, so these are some gates that we have learned. Now, once we learn these walking behaviors in simulation, then we take them and transfer them into the real world. And by real world, I mean different kinds of terrains. So it might be stairs, going into an obstacle, or walking on sand. So here are you know, some results of these systems which were trained in simulation, but then deployed you know, in the real world. Right? Over here, this cheetah is running fast, but it's not just fast. It can go on these challenging terrains and still be stable. Or, for example, over here, it tries to go under an obstacle. Right? So it, it has to crouch before it can go beneath. Or, you know, for example, you know, going up this gravelly hill. You know, sometimes when the robot is doing you know, these behaviors, the environment is not you know, forgiving. You know, for example, once when we were running this robot outside in this building, one of the screws in the knees came off. So what you now see is you know, this robot is limping in a way, but it's still walking. And this is the kind of robustness and generalization that we hope to achieve. Right? And this is not just in context of locomotion. You know, we can also think about in context of manipulation, right? For example, you know, things that we do every day, right? We pick up tools, we use them, right? And we keep doing it all the time, sometimes for a purpose, and sometimes, you know, just for fun, right? And sometimes, you know, we do it because we have to do it, right? So what we can do is, you know, we can also run simulations where we have, you know, lots of hands, you know, simulating, you know, this task of reorienting objects because it is needed to perform a downstream manipulation task. And then we can take 
you know, this learned system in simulation and transfer it into the real world. Right? And the way this system is going to work is it's going to have a camera and going to give some commands to the fingers to move. Right? This is just a side view, so you have a sense of what I'm going to show you. Right? And we're going to evaluate on new objects that the system has never seen before. Right? So, you know, for example, over here on your top right is the goal orientation. And, you know, let's look at what the system ends up doing. So it tries to reorient this object to the target which is shown on the top right. So again, you know, this is some examples showing that in simulation we can leverage large amounts of data and then use it to perform things that seem simple to humans but are actually quite complex. Now, you know, building these you know, physical intelligence or these systems is not just about the control algorithm. It's also a lot about the hardware. You know, for example, the hand that I showed you had no touch sensing. Right? So we need to you know, add to it some more modalities so it can start you know, sensing where it makes contact. Right? And you know, we have been running you know, some experiments with you know, doing problems like, hey, if I give you an object, you know, can you feel, you know, what the object is, right? And, you know, then if I close the lights so it's just dark, can you go and find that object again, right? So, for example, now we put more objects, shut off the light, and the hand still has to find these objects just based on touch sensing. The other question you can ask is, well, is the design of this hand good? Maybe, maybe not, right? So we're developing tools which can help us design you know, better hands. So I'm showing you four examples of four different hands that we were able to design which were optimized for the particular task, right? So for example, over here, you know, here's a hand which can cut things and you know, it can you know, use scissors to decide it can cut paper but not cut acrylic. Right? So in summary, right, it is not just about control but also thinking about perception and also thinking about hardware, right? And we need to think in a full stack way to approach physical intelligence. So to end, what I discussed was this dichotomy between artificial and natural intelligence. And what we think we have is a cherry, right? Which is 10 seconds worth of evolution, you know, models that we have trained on the internet. But the question is, where is my cake? <laughs> right? And you know, while there are some people who believe that you know, we can just go on the internet, train bigger models, and not be embodied, and get to artificial intelligence, you know, me and some other people are maybe on the other camp. We think we need, we need to build the cake first, to build physical intelligence before we can go to true artificial intelligence. Right? And I hope now that more and more people think about physical intelligence, especially that there's a lot of you know, hype and a lot of excitement about disembodied intelligence going on. Right? I think that hype is very good, but we cannot you know, have the cake without building the cake. With that, thank you.